Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Raleigh. I'm the Director of Campaigns and Advocacy here at the Center for Election Science. Um, we have people from all over St. Louis, all over the country on here today. So I will give our, our, our quick little pitch to who we even are. Uh, we are uh, a national nonpartisan uh, nonprofit and we work to empower people and communities with better voting methods. Um, namely, and, and for the most part, we work on approval voting, which is why we're so excited about Prop D. Uh, almost as excited about approval voting is, is we're so excited to work with these folks. We're so excited to work with uh, Michael Butler and Kathleen and, and, and Mallory, and hopefully Rasheen joins us later today. Uh, Hopefully he joins us. Um, but to, tonight, the point of tonight is to uh, sit back, relax a little bit. We're going to have an interesting conversation about uh, not just approved voting, um, as in, but we will go over that. But how can Prop D uh, really impact the lives of people in St. Louis, which we are very excited about. And we have some amazing people that have stood up and worked on this measure. Uh, that being said, if you have not heard about Prop D before, you're gonna hear a ton about it tonight. Uh, Proposition D, uh, D for Democracy, is on the ballot this fall in St. Louis. Uh, used to be able to say November 3rd, but election day is election month now, so it's a little bit harder. So this fall, uh, Prop D is on the ballot. And Prop D has three parts to it. One is, moving St. Louis to a nonpartisan primary. So everybody in one primary. And then using approval voting to go to a top two runoff. Uh, approval voting obviously is, is what kind of got us interested, uh, but the whole package is very exciting. Uh, and we hope people really show up in numbers to vote on it this fall. So how we're gonna do this today is, uh, I'm just gonna lob these guys easy questions. Uh, and they are going to, uh, you know, tell us why they got involved in this effort and really what they think Prop D can do for the, for the people of St. Louis. Um, with that being said, I will give them a, a very proper introduction uh, and uh, I'll let them introduce themselves a little bit as well. But uh, I'll start with Michael Butler. Michael Butler is a St. Louis native, a longtime civil servant. He served in the Missouri House of Representatives from 2012 to 2018 and was then elected as the city's recorder of deeds in 2018. Michael also has served as the sixth ward Democratic Committeeman and the outgoing chair of the Democratic Central Committee. And if he wasn't busy enough, Michael and his wife welcomed their second child into the world earlier this month. So uh, thank you, Michael. You, anything else? Anything else I missed? <laughs> oh, he muted himself. Okay, well, it means I did such a good job that uh, we'll get back to him in a little bit. Um, in the meantime, I will introduce Kathleen Farrell. Kathleen is a proud resident of St. Louis City and has served as the co-president of the League of Women Voters of Metro St. Louis from 2011 to 2017. She began the Voters Guide partnership with the St. Louis Times Dispatch a voter resource that reaches over 250,000 people each election with candidate and ballot issues that uh, is, is spread across 17, seven counties. In addition, the league, the league fought voter suppression and voter ID laws and the state legislature, legislature and courts increased its partnerships with other advocacy and social justice groups. She came to St. Louis in 2002 to become the head of the Department of Communication at St. Louis University. She just retired as a professor. And of course, uh, what better things to do in your retired days than work on uh, voting reform? <laughs> but uh, she retired and uh, her expertise was public argument and communication, which is much needed right now, and volunteers in various ways in the community in St. Louis public schools. Kathleen, how are you doing? Thanks I'm okay. Did I miss anything? Nah. Good. Good. And then uh, finally, I will 
I introduce uh, Mallory Rush. Mallory is the campaign manager for Proposition D. She is a lifelong St. Louis native with 15 years of market, marketing, fundraising, and community organizing experience with national and local nonprofit organizations. She holds a master's degree in public service from the Clinton School in Little Rock, Arkansas. Mallory. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming hey. out. Of course. Thanks for having us, Chris. Um, okay. And uh, has, Regine, has Regine joined us yet? So I'm wondering if Rasheen might be a little held up. I know, so for everyone on the call, Rasheen is a huge community organizer and activist. And I know that- Oh, um, here he is. Oh, yep. awesome. Hey, Rasheen. He's joining, so it might be just a second before he can talk or hear you. And okay, we'll let him catch his breath. Mallory, I was thinking the same thing though, so no worries. We, yeah. could, I, we could offer him some grace. Yeah, absolutely. I was just going to say he's, I think, likely very involved in the um, the protests that are happening today around the verdict in the Breonna Taylor case. Yeah. So um, we're really grateful to him for coming in from the streets to hop on to the call. Wonderful. Well, I will just do Rasheen's uh, bio as, as he's getting ready. Rasheen Aldridge is a St. Louis native and local activist. After the shooting death of Michael Brown in 2014, Rasheen, at just 19 years old, was appointed the youngest member of the Ferguson Commission by the governor of Missouri. He went on to be elected as St. Louis City's fifth ward Democratic committeeman. And earlier this year, he was sworn in as the youngest member of the Missouri House of Representatives. Rasheen was an early supporter of Prop D, serving as one of the five official petitioners during the signature gathering phase of the campaign. Rasheen, how you doing? Can you hear us? We'll get them online soon. Um, well, that being said, we, we will uh, just jump into uh, jump into the questions. And Mallory, as as the as the campaign manager, I will I will start with you first. Um, All right, hit me. So you you are the campaign manager. You've been out on the front lines of the, getting the word out about Prop D. And your best short summation. Can you tell us what Prop D is? Um, and then what, what have you heard about, what have people been saying about Prop D? Absolutely. So um, I will first start by saying that I joined the campaign in uh, June of this year. And so compared to some of these other folks on the call, I'm actually a little bit of a late addition to the team, um, Kathleen, Rasheen, and Michael have all been uh, engaged in the work um, prior to my coming on board. And so it was really amazing to join such an awesome team of community leaders who were already doing this work and really just help to, you know, pick up the ball at the at the 80 yard line and help, you know, move us towards the end zone for all you football fans out there. Um, so Prop D is a municipal election reform in the city of St. Louis. And Chris went over this at the beginning, but I will, for anyone who's joining late, I will, I will hit it again. So Prop D makes three key changes to our municipal election in the city of St. Louis. It opens up our primaries. Um, St. Louis is one of the only cities left in the country using a partisan primary system. So that when you go to the polls to vote for mayor and alderman, you still have to request a party ballot. Um, 80% um, of cities nationwide don't have that system anymore, and we shouldn't either. So we'll open up our primary system so that everyone is on the same ballot. Um, second, it will implement approval voting. And the thing that is very cool about approval voting is that it's really going to cut down on the vote splitting that we've seen in St. Louis. So instead of having to just choose one candidate, you'll be able to express your approval for all of the candidates um, who are who you like in the race. And so what we've often seen is two or three really similar candidates running in very crowded races. And though their platform might be the most popular, um, they end up not winning because their vote is diluted by only being able to choose one person. So it's really incredibly important that we're able to put approval voting in place in St. Louis so that we're actually voting for candidates that share the values and ideas of the majority of the voters. 
And then finally, it takes the top two candidates from that primary contest and it pits them against each other in a top two runoff election. Um, so the cool thing about the top two runoff is that it actually makes the April election matter again. So right now, races are basically entirely decided in the Democratic primary, and everyone in St. Louis knows that. So in our last municipal general election in April of 2019, we only had 10% of voters that even bothered to show up to vote. 10%. So if we're going to have those elections and the city's going to pay for those elections, we should make them matter. And we should take the top two candidates that voters like and value, and we should give them a fair chance to have a final race between the two of them. So we think that all of these things together are going to, you know, come together to form this trifecta and really change and improve the way that we do municipal elections in St. Louis. And people here are excited about it. I've been out in the park the last couple of weekends down in Tower Grove for you St. Louisans out there and have been handing out materials and signs and folks are coming up with questions, they're curious, they're interested, and more than one person has come up to me and said, I'm so excited about this. I think that this is the most important thing on the ballot this November, and that's really saying something. Wonderful. That's very exciting to hear. Um, yeah, when people are bugging you in, in parks, saying, coming up to you and saying that this is the most exciting thing, yeah, I think you're on to something. Um, Rasheen, uh, you know, as, as, we, as we mentioned a little bit, um, you've been working on, on, on issues throughout the city and throughout the region involving police brutality, racial justice, you know, those are, those are super incredible things. What, what got you interested in the movement as well or, or separate or together with, with elections? So, I mean, um, it took me a minute to kind of realize it, but you can't have, you know, you can't have protests uh, without policy working together. Uh, and sometimes we just kind of want one or the other. Um, before running for office, not being a state rep and committee man, but before that, I've done a lot of activism for us. I mean, in the city of St. Louis, which Ferguson isn't too far from St. Louis, everything in St. Louis is like really close. It takes about 20 minutes. You hop on 70 or 40, you get that pretty quick. But, you know, in 2014, this was the epic center of everything that happened with the death of Mike Brown. And in a way where we really start having different conversations about like criminal justice and looking at it in a different way of not just equal, but more equitable, right? And I think over time, that Ferguson effect of what we called it trickled into politics where you've seen people move from, you know, protest to politics, even still now, Corey Bush, uh, who's our Congresswoman, uh, once upon a time, Bruce Franks, who is a state representative, you know, you've seen these people, John Muhammad, move from protest to politics. And then we kind of moved from, as we started to connect with people like Mike um, and others and started to build relationships, you know, you move from kind of like um, protest to policy. And in the city of St. Louis, um, you know, no matter if you're on the state level or local level, city of St. Louis, everything hits back home. And to see some of the recent elections and the way that certain individuals, especially as we're having like real tough conversations in our city, you're talking about closing a workhouse, you're talking about um, things that actually on a local level, we can make policy change in certain departments and really get some real criminal justice reform or housing reform or economic uh, justice reform, reparations in on a local level. Um, but the way our current political system is set up, it, it don't really allow for those tough conversations. You know, you have that one race um, in the August primary and then you move to the general. And in the city of St. Louis, uh, if you win your August race, most likely, you know, you're gonna win the general race. So for me, it was about, as we moved to more policy, as I heard about Prop D, I thought it was a, a good idea for people to be able to, especially even if as, as an elected official, you know, we got a voter engagement problem in the city of St. Louis. We love to register people to vote, but we forget about engaging people. So this gives us an opportunity as electeds to continue to work hard um, for the general election, and making sure that we're reaching out to voters, having those tough conversations and actually giving voters kind of a, uh, a mandate of a vote and not just 30% of the vote or 40% of the vote. And then 
you know, you're elected into these positions. Yeah, thank you so much, Rasheen. And, and, and Michael, as our other fellow uh, elected, you know, we are also curious, you know, what, what brought you here? You know, not many elected officials are, are banging down the door to change how they are elected. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm curious to get, again, learn what brought you here. And uh, you've done such an amazing job advocating for Proposition D on, on the radio uh, and, and news. You know, so part one, what brought you here? And part two, you know, what, what are, what are the, those big questions you hear when you maybe go out and, and you talk to folks? What brought me to support Prop D is I just like good policy ideas. I, do, I mean, I, I got into politics to um, get involved in new and good and bring good policy to my city and to the state. I started as a state representative at the age of 26, around the age Rasheen is now. So he's carrying the torch much higher and stronger than I am. And I just, I'm not as exciting as Rasheen. So I'm more of a policy wonk. And uh, I, I, it was just a good idea. Um, I first heard about the idea at a as former the former chair of the Central Committee, which uh, the, the local St. Louis Democratic Party organization, which me and Rasheen uh, were on. Uh, Rasheen was actually a, a, a like a founding member of like the lo local organization, and someone came and presented at our party meeting. Uh, I think, and I, if I remember correctly, I think Rasheen was the one who asked, "Hey, can they come present?" And when I first heard the idea, it was very I don't I wasn't skeptical. I was like, "Wow, this is interesting." I was very interested. Um, or Rasheen smiling, he tested. The m most of the Democrats there were like, I don't know about this. Yeah. And um, when I began to re research more, I was like, hey, let me, this is interesting. Let me research it more. And I, everything I, I did in the state legislature, and you hear, you hear 100 ideas a day, Rasheen, don't you, in the state legislature? So you, you learn to research things. You can't go off your first uh, instinct or what everybody, everybody else says, because those folks would change their mind too. So uh, at the end of the day, Prop D and approval voting really solves a lot of our issues. I mean, it, it's in when what you when you research more, you find out we're we're the ones that need reforming. We're we're out of the we're we're uh, out of the we're not the we're the outliers when it comes to the way our municipal elections are run in, around the country. And when and you consider that, it's just uh, it's a no brainer. It's just a very good policy idea. It's something that um, uh, locally, one to have a nonpartisan election that has a runoff. Kansas City does. Chicago does. San Francisco has ranked choice of similar to, and it's sent similar to this. I mean, other well, large municipalities have, all, have always had these runoff elections, but to throw approved voting on top of it, uh, I think it makes us look uh, forward thinking in St. Louis. It, I, I like it better than ranked choice. I've been a fan of ranked choice, but, but I do understand a little, some of the pushback. I don't agree with the pushback, but I understand it. Um, I think approved voting solves a lot of those ranked choice issues. Um, and at the end of the day, it's, if we can be the first in St. I'm excited because we can be the first in St. Louis to do it, like first major city to do it. Then all of a sudden, you know, we look like rock stars and maybe San Francisco is going to trade over and do what we did. Wouldn't that be cool? We finally, maybe we're leading San Francisco or something one day. Yes, yes. The trendsetters. I love it. Uh, and, and just, to, you know, follow up, you know, you, you've been out there, as, as everyone has, um, you know, explaining this to people. You know, what is... What are, you talked about pushback a little bit, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, not just about approval voting, but, but about the idea of property in general. So, you know, uh, what are some of the biggest questions people have? And then, you know, what normally do you I say think, or do that gets them over that? Over that? Very, very good question. I think uh, St. Louis is, is a 80% democratic city, 80%. Sometimes higher, we go as high as 85. As a party chair, I was hoping to raise it to 87, 90 this cycle. Um, and it, we, may, we just might get there. I think that, um, I think people are worried that they won't have a stronghold over St. Louis politics if approval voting happens. And when you're at 87%, uh, that's just, you're, we're not gonna lose that. I mean, we're, we're, we're not gonna lose that unless a, a groundswell of 50,000 to 100,000 Republicans move to St. Louis City. And I'll be honest, I would love for Republicans to move to St. Louis City. Come on, we need the population increase, don't we, Rasheen? I'm not afraid of that. I mean, we're, we're, we're fine. Uh, but even if 100,000 Republicans move to St. Louis City, we're still going to be like 60% Democrat. I mean, we're, we're, the, the Democrats are going to hold on to, 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 to uh, our values here and, and our majority, our strong majority here in St. Louis. I think the other thing, 
uh, so it's the it, it's one of fear of majority. And the one thing I push back on that is that all our other all the other huge democratic strongholds in the country that are much larger than us, that are doing better than us, that are more progressive than us, already do this. Um, one is four hours down the street, Kansas City has a runoff election, I, and and we talk about diversity. Kansas City has a black mayor, has had one for the past nine years, has a black police chief, has a black county executive at the exact same time for the past four years. I mean, they find a way, and, and Kansas City has actually a, a lower um, popular uh, percentage of population of African Americans in St. Louis. In St. Louis City, we're about 48% African American, and Kansas City is about 30 some percent African American. Folks in Kansas City, because of the runoff election, I think uh, in most cases where an African American makes it to the to the uh, the runoff election, really in the past, I want to say eight cycles, um, that gives that African American a chance to go head up, and not and 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 a lot of folks don't vote based on racial, they vote on who the who, who the best candidate is. Um, you look at Chicago, you look at New York, you look at other, I mean, major Democratic strongholds have runoff elections and they're still Democratic. They're still Democrat. I mean, Republican hasn't won in these areas in very long time. So I, I, that is really the biggest pushback. And when you explain to folks, hey, think about it. Um, are you gonna, you know, we're, we're still gonna have a stronghold here in, in Missouri, whether we have approval voting or not. Most people agree. The other thing is that I honestly think Democrats should earn our vote. They should, you should earn someone's vote whether you have an 90% majority or not. And when you put that back on folks, say, hey, should we get it automatically or should we have to earn folks' vote based on, uh, on where you stand on the issues, based on the, uh, the, the new ideas you're bringing forward? And I, I love approval voting and a runoff election because it allows, you, uh, allows for voters and candidates to focus more on those things rather than the fact that a D behind, is behind their name. Awesome. Awesome. Speaking of supporters, uh, Kathleen, the League of Women Voters, is supporting uh, Prop D and was one of the early, early supporters. Uh, you know, what about Prop D? Encourage you to support it. And, and what did the League of Women Voters hope and, and maybe feel that this could do for the people of St. Louis? Okay. First of all, I want to thank Rasheen and Michael for when the League of Women Voters, particularly after Ferguson, knew that they had to be far more activists and work for, for racial justice and justice, um, they welcomed us. I first met Rasheen as a 19-year-old young man, and he welcomed us. And we've been in several fights together. Uh, and that doesn't happen everywhere. You know? So here we were, a bunch of traditional old ladies. And uh, we went to Ferguson and went other places and fought for the St. Louis school system to be returned to its elected board, et cetera, et cetera. And both Michael and Rasheen welcomed us. And that doesn't happen everywhere. And I wanna thank them for their open-mindedness. Uh, so here we had the league who was trying, uh, who has become much more advocates. We do not endorse candidates, but we too, take strong positions on issues. And last summer, um, a small determined group of young people approached us and said, you know, we wanted to make elections better. And they'd already done a lot of research on alternative election systems. They got a grant from the Center for Election Science and they crafted a ballot initiative and were beginning to organize a signature collecting campaign. That was the first thing we liked about them is this was not uh, dark money trying to get something on the ballot because they were gonna get something out of it. This was a true grassroots citizen petition and people that we respected were involved with it. Uh, so uh, they came and they presented us and because they also knew that the league had had a key role in clean Missouri, which is being threatened now on our November ballot redistricting and and campaign ethics, um, they thought we should be approached. And we studied it. Our board unanimously said, let's not only support it, let's work for it. And so a very small 120 group of women decided that they would work on signature collection, they would work on advocacy, and do whatever we could to get this passed. Here's why. We had always supported non partisan municipal governments. It was the way to go. 
It was better government. The evidence was clear. I moved here in 2002 and was absolutely astonished at how badly the city government worked. Uh, other parts of the government too, but uh, I was just stunned by it and stunned by the vote splitting and stunned by the amount of time that this infighting took when we had critical and heartbreaking problems to work on. And so we knew that that was a better way to go. And we were very unhappy that for the last number of years, our candidates who were successful are elected by less than 40%, sometimes close to 30%. It was crazy. And you would see that two people, as uh, Mallory talked about, who were on the ballot, who had very similar views, you know, both would get knocked out and somebody else would come in their place. We also knew that there was dark money involved sometimes in supporting some of these candidates to do exactly that, to vote split. And we knew that that was wrong. So we were really ready to listen. So here's why we think it's important. Those reasons and also it increases voter interest and participation. I agree, we're great at registering voters and the League of Women Voters is great at registering voters. But I gotta tell you, you have to engage voters. You have to help them get a vision of what their government should be. You have to help voters inform themselves and build coalitions and get them to care about it and go vote. And that was our job too. And a part of our job, we weren't doing very well. And we were trying to do better, particularly after Ferguson. So we thought this was a perfect opportunity to do that. Second reason was it also encouraged new candidates with new ideas and representing different parts of our community. And that's what approval voting does. And I agree, forward thinking, it's much better because you can get a sense of, of what the voters think about uh, positions on certain issues the leadership qualities of new candidates. And you get that sort of, uh, you know, you get a vote on that uh, in the first phase. And even if somebody doesn't end up being one of the top two vote getters, uh, they got it, you get a sense, you start to get to know them. And I think you have a much richer conversation. Uh, the third reason is that it allows uh, candidates to be more accountable. I couldn't agree with Michael Moore. Uh, I have been to a number of ward organizations. I've talked privately with a number of aldermen and committee people who are against this, okay? And they can't tell me exactly why. And they just say it'll destroy the Democratic Party. And I said, what good is the Democratic Party if it doesn't put, put forward and hold accountable the best people to serve the state, okay? And do you really want to look at a general election and be proud of a party that turns a, a 10% voter turnout to elect a mayor mm -hmm. or a president of a board of aldermen, et cetera, et cetera? I mean, that's embarrassing. And we do think that these candidates should be accountable, uh, not just to the party, but to everyone. We also believe that the top vote getters ought to be in the last election. I mean, that's just simple. We ought to have those two top vote getters. Then you can have uh, a serious conversation. You can have a serious contrast. Uh, people are gonna be interested in that election and it's going to massively increase turnout. And also when you think about our general election in St. Louis City, it just so happens that that 10% turnout was also the election where we were electing school board members. And if you know anything about the St. Louis community, you know that we've got to do better with our schools. And to only have 10% of voters voting in that election on our school board members was a travesty. It gives elected officials a mandate and makes them more responsible to the community. And I agree with Rasheen, protest demonstration policy. Okay, they work together and people would have a meaningful mandate to lead if they had 60% of the vote even. Uh, and right now they don't have a meaningful mandate to lead. 
So those are the reasons why the league supported it and why so, no, so many of our members are working hard to try to get it passed. Awesome. Thank you, Kathleen. You hit on so many good things that, that I want to talk about. And, and I, I, I want to ask for Sheen, because uh, he brought this up about getting people engaged, right? You know, one thing we, we, we think and hope about approval voting is uh, on our side, as folks that really love approval voting, is that people will, will be able to vote for their favorite. They'll be more excited. They'll be maybe more interested. So I would love to hear from, from you and, and Michael too, as people who have run for office, right? And as well as your own ideas, you know, how will this change? A, do you think this may get more people involved and interested and excited? Yes or no? And, uh, you know, as a candidate, how do you think that would change how you may approach something? Well, I can say, I think for, uh... And that's why I'm sure you got the support of me and Mike, you know, we're the type of candidates where, you know, I, being a committee man over the last two years and him being, uh, you know, the chair of the DCC, when it comes to different ways to try to engage the community and try to figure out ways that we can continue to, you know, connect with the community, not just during election time. It's times I had to have like ice cream socials with Mike at senior buildings, you know, to make sure we're checking up on seniors. So you got you got two candidates if you if you say you know adding a couple more months to only engage i think that's the mission that we want to see in our city and that's why approval voting um you know is something we can support but it would definitely in the city of st louis in my opinion it definitely help us like i say right now we don't really got an issue with getting folks registered we should definitely keep doing that you know there's a lot of young people that are now being more engaged into politics uh never than before uh you know folks kind of think that young folks aren't engaged, but you know, these issues just affect them as well. We should continue to register, I'm not saying that, but what we fall short is, is we work hard in the primaries and, and we try to do as much, depending on what candidate you are, you try to do as much political education and then after the primaries, it stopped. And we kind of set, you know, a, a precedent, even for the community that there's no really major elections coming up. Uh, we we kind of, you know, maybe in a general election, we got president, we may want to do a little bit more work. But usually when we have, you know, automatic races or uh, our mayor races, our president board of races, and we're not talking small structures of government, like I may be a state rep, but your alderman has more leverage and power when you're talking about development, um, when you're talking about actually bringing concrete change that people can see firsthand compared to policies that sometimes pass on the state level and it take a couple years, right? You're talking about a mayor and a president board of aldermen that moves a whole legislative chamber to get policy done that affects the city of St. Louis and affects our growth or continue to affect our decline, right? So this is only going to force uh, electors to do more work, but ultimately engage more constituents in their, uh, in their areas that they're supposed to represent because they're going to have to visit them more. They have to have those hard conversations. They're going to have to say why, you know, you, you helped me get past the finish line in August, but you know, the fight's not done yet. We still got some conversations. We still got an election. We got to win. And you got to constantly engage people like that ongoingly and not just, you know, stopping the primary. Marie, and I'll say as two elected officials, we, we, we honestly know how to navigate the system already or navigate elections in St. Louis. Well, I don't think that folks should have to navigate. I mean, you, if you are interested in running, then you should be able to put your name on a ballot and you have, and you have good ideas and you, and, uh, and, and you, should, you should be able to run and have a chance of winning. I think, especially when it comes to local elections, folks, the way our system is set up uh, municipally and the same way in, in the state level and folks mm -hmm. folks running for a state level or let's say a president, they're always afraid that they're going to take votes away from the folks that they like. I mean, that's a legitimate candidate issue for anyone who is who's not a, who's not an actual stalking horse who actually wants to change um that doesn't feel themselves as very popular i consider myself that person sometimes i mean like I said, i'm not as excited as popular as rasheen so <laughs> and, and rasheen wasn't even Rash, who rasheen is now you know and he was 18 but was he prepared to run for run for office or he had great ideas hell yeah i knew him when he was 18 he did so um no i think that folks should who have good ideas and who belong in office 
should not have these barriers or the guilt for running. And approval voting really removes that. It really gives you the opportunity to say, hey, I'm just going to run and give it all that I got, and I can still vote for the person I like later on. Um, it's, I think that, that that will change the way uh, some candidates run. How does that increase turnout? Let's say if we have 40 candidates run for mayor and 20 run for president board or alderman. For a city, that is still big. I mean, St. Louis City is still, has almost 300,000 people in it. I mean, I was down in Deep South City the other day, and I was up in North City the next day in, in pretty high North City. I mean, we have a very large city. You can't, as one candidate, reach all those people. As three mayor candidates or 10 citywide candidates, if you're not going to touch all those voters. The more candidates you get, the more folks are like, oh, I like, I like Kathleen for this office. And then even if Kathleen loses later, Kathleen's going to say, well, hey, I met Rasheen on the campaign trail. I'm supporting him now. Um, uh, we, we actually were, you know, he, he's more aligned with what I think. That's a, all, that is really a grassroots way to engage voters. And we, what you find really in election statistics, you guys probably know this is center election science. The more folks that run in a primary, you generally see an uptick in, uh, in, in uh, the more candidates, you have an uptick in engagement and an uptick in votes, you generally see that. And then sometimes in a lot of cases, not all the time, a lot of cases, those votes turn around into the general election. But more importantly, those folks who are the first time voters, they're more likely to stay more engaged after the general election and to be engaged uh, with their government later on, and, and especially local government. And that's, that's great for St. Louis. That'd be great for us to have more eyes on, on our city government and more accountability and more people uh, interested in voting because their cousin or someone they knew ran in a primary. You know, we, we, we agree, right? You know, the problem is, is if 40 people run, right now you'd only be able to vote for one still. So, and, 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 and uh, I do this work all over the country. That's the case in some places, 20, 24 people run, people still only get one vote. And you guys are gonna be, St. Louis is gonna be ahead of all of them. Um, do we get Mallory back? I know Mallory's having some uh, difficulty with her, with her, there she is, there, there she is. So uh, uh, I have been a part of many elections. We have all been a part of many elections. None of us have been a part of any elections during a pandemic. <laughs> um, you know, how, how is that changing things? Not just how you do it, but maybe how people talk, maybe how people talk about issues, you know, how it changes the conversation on things like homelessness and, uh, you know, uh, even violence or, or what happens with the police in the city. You know, that's, that's, there's just, just that huge X factor of the coronavirus. So A, what's it like being a campaign manager in that? <laughs> and B, you know, how's it affecting like the, the political conversation? Yeah, great questions. Um, so to the first question, you know, I think all of the campaigns that are happening right now are just figuring it out together, right? So we are really working hard um, to make sure that we are able to implement the campaign in a way that feels safe, both for our volunteers and for the voters that we're hoping to engage with. So for example, our campaign, along with most of the campaigns in the city, have um, shied away from your typical door-to-door -door canvassing effort and are instead doing no contact lit drops. Um, so still getting voter you know, information direct to voters at their homes, but not necessarily asking folks to come out on their porch and engage with a stranger, you know, which some folks don't feel comfortable doing even with a mask on. Uh, so you know, we're doing our best in that way. I will say, it's challenging, right? With a campaign like this, we want to be at events. We want to be in the streets. We want to be out talking to people. And so many of the things that we would have normally done and gone to and been at just aren't happening or they're happening online. And I think that um, tonight's turnout aside, it's great to see everybody. Um, people are really experiencing a lot of election fatigue, um, or sorry, a lot of Zoom fatigue, maybe election fatigue also, but Zoom fatigue, where, you know, when community meetings and events are getting moved online, you know, especially if you're working from home and you're on Zoom all day, maybe you don't wanna be on another Zoom meeting. So we've seen things like, ward meetings have really low turnouts when they're moved on to Zoom where they would be, you know, three or five times higher in terms of attendance 
um, if we were meeting in person like we would normally be doing in a year like this. So there are a lot of barriers, but we're doing our best to reach more people online, um, more digital ads. We're gonna have a huge text banking effort that happens next month. So if you're out there and thinking about getting involved and wanna text from home, that's a great way you can reach voters from the, the comfort of your own home. Um, to your second question, Chris, you know, I think that what the pandemic has done in St. Louis in particular is it has really highlighted and brought to the surface the incredible racial and socioeconomic disparities that have been plaguing St. Louis for a really long time, right? Anyone who lives in St. Louis has at least some level of understanding about the amount of um, of disparity in terms of health outcomes, in terms of income, in terms of um, generational wealth, in terms of um, interactions with the police. Basically, like St. Louis is a city where um, there is a long, long history of racial disparities. And um, it's something that we deal with on a, on a daily basis, right? And so the pandemic environment has really, um, has really brought that to the forefront maybe for folks who didn't see it before. And so, you know, it, to find a silver lining, it's raising a lot of really important conversations that maybe wouldn't, weren't happening pre-pandemic. Um, it's raising a lot of frustrations. It's raising a lot of questions about um, how local elected officials are handling situations um, and where there is a real disconnect between the needs and the voice of the community and the way that our government is handling things. And so, you know, I think that there's a great ongoing conversation that um, really is directly tied to the work that we're trying to do here with municipal election reform. And it's a really timely way for us to think about the impacts that our vote has at a local level. Wonderful. And, and, and one thing that comes to mind is, you know, we are Center for Election Science. We're, we're definitely a part of this because A, it's a good idea. And B, we are so excited to see another city uh, be interested in, in wanting to, to, to use a proof of voting. Um, and I'm just going to talk about that piece for a little bit. I'm going to ask you just maybe a lightning round uh, on everyone. A proof of voting, and I'll start with you, Kathleen, first. Approved voting, you have to get the votes from the most amount of people possible, right? You got to be broad. You have to try to talk to as many people possible. You have to be as, uh, as broadly supported as possible. What do you think, and this is a question to everyone, just that fact may have on, on these issues that we've been talking about that aren't being addressed, right? Do, we, do you think the candidates will talk about them more? You know, and and when they get elected, you know, what what incentives or disincentives do you see knowing that they have to do approval voting again in the future? Oh, I think they definitely are going to have to engage because in some cases, and it varies from ward to ward, but in some places, somebody thinks, oh, I'm going to get the ward recommendation to run for this office. That's all I need. Um, and uh to understand that that just because you have a, a D next to your name uh, doesn't make you necessarily a better candidate. And you're also gonna have to, to get out there and get support and under and get a niche for yourself. You've got to distinguish who you are uniquely and what you care about and why you would be good for this. And you've got to engage people and there's no other way of doing it. Uh, because if you happen to be one of the two that survives that first round and goes to the second round, you know, mm -hmm. in our case, we only have one month really between those elections, uh, March and April, and uh, in terms of our local elections. And secondly, those people that you talk to are going to remember and they're going to come see you. And you're going to have to continue those conversations. And Michael is right. You can't get to everybody. But you have to develop a presence and a reputation and, you know, competence. Uh, and the only way you do that is interacting. 
Yeah, and Rashin, I'll go to you now. You know, same question, just, you know, I'll say it a little differently. You know, we talked about campaigning, right? Campaigning, knowing that you have an approval voting election, but like legislating, right? Creating policy, um, maybe getting along or not getting along with people, right? Knowing that you have an approval voting election in the back of your mind, you know, do you feel like it, a lot of these issues are more likely to actually have some sort of resolution and 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 the legislature, whether it's just you know right now it's the city, but in a different situation. But uh, yeah, how what effect might it have on on legislating? No, I think uh, with one point that uh, Mike brought up. So say you do have forty people, which I will say it, it is an issue. I wouldn't say forty, but like in the fifth ward uh, where I represent. You know, just a couple of years ago, you have five people running for office, right? So you have five people running, five different ideas. Um, and, you know, a lot of folks maybe agree with this change agent or may agree with this change agent who was running against incumbent. Um, and it, it kind of forces us to really, you know, have these tough conversations about the different issues that are going on and not just allowing, you know, all the, you know, because what I can say over the last couple of years, what I've seen is some magnificent candidates that really stepped up, you know, to run for office all across the city that have brilliant ideas, but just because maybe they didn't have the money, because uh, that's also real, right? They didn't have the money to be able to reach everyone just on a ward level. Um, you know, first time running for office, there's no blueprint to this stuff, right? Um, so even with having the best ideas, sometimes it's people that know the way of the politics to get elected. But what approval voting does, it forces those candidates that really do have like amazing ideas that's going to move our city forward. And when we're talking about going forward, when we say progressive, that means us moving forward. And that means sometimes bold ideas. And those bold ideas may not get traction in the primary, but we continue to have those conversations. You know, you can even get candidates to coalesce uh, amongst each other. So you're, you're kind of bringing some camaraderie, right? you're engaging with other candidates and their ideas and saying, okay, this is something I didn't think about as a candidate. I love to work with you. You're still in the community. I love to work with you and, you know, work on that issue and get their support. And it only builds not just for better engagement, but it also builds for us to have candidates that are actually taking the time to really think outside the box and for us as a community to have those tough, difficult, difficult conversations to really be able to engage on things that's going to impact our city moving forward. I think Rasheen hit a round head. I want to add it. I think uh, approved voting after the election is done on how do you govern in an approval voting city, uh, it creates a system where more, it's more likely, not guaranteed, but more likely that elected officials will work together. Um, I mean, you see that in, uh, in San Francisco, at least. I mean, I, I, there were two candidates who ran during ranked choice voting. It's a runoff election, but then we ranked choice, at least. Uh, I, I know Jane Kim and I came around the other candidate that ran coinciding campaigns for mayor towards the end who were working together, like, vote for both of us. Vote for both of us. Um, neither one of them won. Uh, London Breed is still an amazing mayor. She's still doing a great job. But uh, that kind of cooperation, these were two supervisors who were already friends, that doesn't create the animosity that clearly occurs as candidates when you're when you even if you were friends before and you're running against each other for you know a dream job you, you're gonna have some disdain and in st louis and st louis politics i can tell you in in, in chicago style thug doggy dog politics um two people running against each other not gonna like each other at the end of the campaign so uh approval voting allows you to say hey you know they're gonna vote for me and you so we don't have to hate each other. Why don't you, you know, why, why, don't, why don't we work together? Then you continue that working together afterwards, which uh, more likely two people running together is a bond that is stronger than anything in St. Louis politics too. It's like you're in the, you're in the same group. Uh, but I will also say another thing is that approved voting makes it hard to ignore groups of people. Mm -hmm. It makes it extreme, it makes it almost impossible, not absolutely impossible, but almost impossible to ignore large groups of people. And as Mallory has mentioned before, like in racial policies in St. Louis, I mean, there, there are candidates who win in St. Louis, totally ignoring the black community. I mean, just it, without going north of Del Mar, not spending, we're spending remedial amount, I'm not gonna say zero amount, but remedial amount of money north of Del Mar, just ignoring the black community. That's, that is the largest group in, in St. Louis. And 
Um, I, I think approved voting that does not allow you, there's no path to victory with doing, but honestly, there's a very, very slim path to victory with doing that, where right now the path to victory is pretty clear. It's been going on for, for quite some time is to, you know, stack the deck and then uh, hyper, uh, hyper into hyper uh, spin in certain areas. Uh, and, and we see the results of that. We see the results of that in our in our area. We see the results of that across the city. It doesn't. It it it. it and when it comes to governing, to your question, Chris, um, people continue that when they're governing. They ignore large parts of the city. And when you ignore those parts, you get this, you get issues like high crime and high poverty. And when you ignore those, ignore large organizations, they're not in a certain part of a city. Like if you ignore uh, just protesters. Um, then, then you're gonna you're gonna get results where where people don't where the community doesn't feel like they're heard and people are on new, on the news and say and, and, and have great ideas they still don't get them passed in, in a local government people don't feel like their vote counts they don't feel heard they're gonna move away or they're just gonna uh, uh, rebel against the system you have can you continue to have protests um, so I think once again the beauty is that it's it's not impossible I don't want to say it's impossible from a policy one standpoint yeah you can you there's a slim path to victory for you to to galvanize 35 to 40 percent of the of of the uh, electorate in a city that just hates um, people with the first name R, Rashin, and then you know, and then you're able to just get all those people, and then those same people, you just pick up maybe 11 percent who doesn't have a first name R into the general election you win. That's so slim, though. It's possible to slim. What's more likely the path to victory is that hey. Um, you got to include folks. You got to be right on the issues. You can't run on a par you can't just run on your party platform. You got to you got to include folks. So let me add to that one one other thing is that I believe that nonpartisan elections and what you see across the country and I'm hoping you guys can back me up on this Center for Election Science. They actually make the parties more relevant. When when you have everybody running a nonpartisan, particularly and I saw a question in the chat. Technically, everybody's running as an independent. Most people who do associate with political party, they're gonna to wanna to know, well, hey, do you associate with the party I associate with? In Chicago, in New York, the party in, in, in smaller towns in Illinois, not, not too far from here, the party becomes more relevant because folks, they they the the local those local par, local party members depend on the local party to tell them who the Democrats are, who the Republicans are in that race. So it's it's actually the opposite. Like the party is going to have more power to say, "Hey, um, Rasheen and Kathleen are more like Democrats than Michael is because he's he's he was up in Jefferson City. He like hung out with a lot of Republicans. So you know, we really don't know what's happening to him. And the, and and people literally candidates literally are required to go to the party and say, "Hey." Brand me as one of you so that I can be, uh, you know, can, can maybe run as a Democrat on this nonpartisan election. And what that allows the party to do, especially a party that is diverse and is moving much more progressive and younger in St. Louis City, is that allows that party structure to then impose its ideas and its new ideas. And our, our party is large, 56 members across a 300,000 uh, person city is, is very large and there's a lot of. Uh, a um, lot of new ideas and a, a, a lot of diverse talent. It allows that party to say, "Hey, here's what you should. Here's what we believe in as a party. Before before we can put a D behind your name, or we can believe in you, you got to believe in these same things. And one of those things go is approval voting." Yeah, I, I believe you said it either today or in uh, an interview before. The parties aren't going anywhere, right? It's it's about it's about a competition, right? It's about we want everyone at ending level wants the best person, right? We all want the best person uh, for, for, for the job and, uh, you know, the, the parties can help the parties, uh, but right now they, you know, at the local level, it, it just seems like a little extra. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Mallory, you know, you get one of the final ones and then I'll give you a softball right after this. But uh, again, you know, what do you think, how this can affect how people govern, you know, you become elected person tomorrow under approval voting how is that going to change how you do think yeah i mean you have to i'm i'm not going to say i don't think anything that the other three haven't already so eloquently stated but you have to reach across lines of difference whether that be to a different part of the city to people with different lived experiences to people of different races you know 
it is, I, I think that there's been this really false narrative that our um, very limited opposition has said that, you know, approval voting is just going to make sure that we elect milk toast candidates, um, which is such a hilarious phrase to me. Um, because to me, what that means is we're electing consensus candidates. And if you are running on a consensus agenda, you are going to rule, rule, <laughs> uh, you are going to govern in a consensus way. You're going to work to make sure that people are on board and that you are serving the good of the majority. And I would argue that is not what is happening right now. Um, we live in a society that is so hyper helpful this moment has become a dirty word. I think we really have to push back against that and we really have to look for candidates who want to run on a platform that is about building consensus and who want to govern in a way that is about building consensus. And I think that Prop D is what it's going to take for us to get there as a city. Speaking of consensus, what is the consensus of, of this group? Uh, how do they feel about, you know, how do they feel going to, into the fall? And uh, is this something that either other places in the state, other cities around uh, may be interested after you do this? But, so one, how are you feeling? And two, do you think other people are, uh, are interested in, in picking up the torch after you, uh, you know, hopefully bring it home. I'll do Kathleen. Well, I think we have a lot of work to do. And um, I think there's still a lot of voters who don't understand uh, Prop D and how very practically it would affect how they vote. And so I don't think we can let down at all about that. Uh, I think opposition is, you know, going to continue to appear and maybe, you know, get stronger and have some money behind it. But I, I do think, and I wanted to say that, you know, in a city where uh, Rasheen is right and Michael is right, uh, the party is becoming more progressive with young voters. The thing that breaks my heart sometimes is I see people who I think share the same values. Uh, turn on each other. I, and I think vote splitting encourages that. And I think it, it decreases the strength, in our case of the progressive movement. I, and I think that approval voting would help with that. Uh, because in the end, I think it would see what people have in common. I do think that people around us will see this. There are still dysfunctional city governments around. And I think if they can see that this can work and also see it can help people understand that the political party system uh, can be made to work. It doesn't have to be thrown out and that their vote does matter and they can vote for somebody that they really support. So I think they will come to us uh, because they know our dysfunctions. And if we can pull this off and it produces better government, it's going to be very attractive. All right, Rasheen, uh, same question. How are you feeling? And do you think anyone else, you know, or any of your, your colleagues in Jefferson City or, or elsewhere in the state can be interested after this? Yeah, I mean, it, it too, I would, I would say, you know, in this moment, you know, it's glad to be on the phone. It's hard for me not to think about, you know, the verdict that, you know, yeah. came down about, yeah. uh, you know, Breonna Taylor. And I think, right. you, know, you know, it, Prop D could be, um, you know, we, we had a lot of conversations today. So, I mean, I'm feeling, I'm here, I'm present, uh, but far as far as Prop D, you know, I am excited about it because this is something that really gives, um, you know, folks an avenue, like Mike said, groups that um, are doing a lot of amazing work. And when I say organizing here in the city of St. Louis on the ground, really organizing hard uh, to see the change and not just in criminal justice reform and housing reform, to see the city not continue to do equitable things or equal things, but equitable things, right? So this gives an opportunity sometimes for those groups that, uh, and, and different neighborhood organizations um, 
that push back against issues that they feel like would hurt their community um, or hurt their city moving forward, kind of give them more of a voice to make that policy change uh, by holding their elected officials accountable. So I am excited about that. Um, and I think, you, you know, we, St. Louis got its first share of problems, but we do love our city. That's one thing about it. We are resilient. And, you know, sometimes, and a lot of times we, we slow to change. I think by us, you know, passing Prop D and showing how it could really be a game changer for a city that is trying to get back on the rise, right? When you're talking, hopefully, population and economically, COVID has hurt uh, in many ways, but just even in policy, right? This is something that can change um, cities with elected folks that's actually going to implement policy that's going to move us going 21st century and not continuing to stay um, and a generation behind with policy and candidates that only care about policy that's going to keep us stagnating instead of moving forward. I'm feeling pretty good about uh, the, our chances come November. I'm feeling very good about. It. I think I I think I commented before. I, there there is doesn't seem to be an organized uh, opposition campaign. I think I'm with Kathleen. I think we're going to start to see it. I think they're pretty late now, but with a month out, anything can happen. Um, I think I think Mal. I've, I've known Mallory for some time. I've at least watched at least watched Mallory. I've been I was in an organization she ran a long time ago. So I know Mallory's on it, and I know she's up for the fight. Uh, so we're, we're, I I think that we just can't get too. Um, the word's not complacent because I know Mallory, but uh, you know we haven't seen a strong <laughs> opposition yet. Sometimes that lulls campaigns into a little uh, a little sleep. And then somebody pops up all of a sudden and, and gets us. I think it's going to happen under Mallory. So I'm feeling very good about it. I do agree with Kathleen Tudor. I think that while there's excitement, there is also, and Mallory can that there's also still a lot of uh, questions about it, mm -hmm. about Prop B. And I think this is the time in any campaign, a little uh, 60 days out, where, every, where people are still learning and still getting educated. This is the high time between 60 to 20 days out where folks are, the, 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 the middle row folks are getting educated. 20 days out, I know we're going to be kicking butt and going forward. But I'm feeling very good about it. I think, uh, I don't think that people are going to follow us. The other thing about Missouri, and, you know, <laughs> I'm in the legislature. We're very much a, um, uh, we're, we're not, we're very much a, a who did it first state. And then they, they, we're, we're like a, let's watch the guinea pig state. Uh, it, outside of St. Louis and Kansas City, Folks are going to, they're going to follow us after like five years. They're not going to come up the first year or two years. They're going to wait to see how the marriage race go. And if they don't like our result, they're definitely not going to follow us, <laughs> which means we're going to like our result. And that means they're not going to like it. They're probably not going to follow. Um, I think they're going to wait till we, you know, some of the policy things we do show some results and then they're going to follow us. Say, oh, that policy that the you know the approval voting created that policy change that now we should like then they're going to be like hey we, we probably should but i don't imagine that a lot of folks are gonna try to jump behind st louis on this i can see more rust belt cities like cleveland or um or uh you know springfield illinois or indianapolis indiana maybe followed us on approval voting but uh you know the thing that you know the other cities in missouri who have a competition with us from time to time are going to follow us i, I seriously doubt <laughs> well, Michael, if they follow us within five years, that's really pretty fast. You're right. That's true. <laughs> yeah. that, is true. <laughs> that is my hope. Well, so one one thing that I will say is that, and I'm going to protect their anonymity for a moment, but I did get a call from a city council person in a nearby municipality who had a lot of questions about this and was very interested in it. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna name them, um, but I'm gonna say there there are some conversations happening and people people are taking notice. And actually, um, coming out of the St. Louis County elections, um, which for those of you outside of St. Louis, our city and county are divorced from each other and are governed separately which is a whole other shenanigan that we would need a whole other call to talk about. Um, but within the county, um, there was just an election for their chief executive, the county executive, that was a four-way race that was very close in the primary. Um, and actually on a political talk show, immediately following that race, we had some local sort of political wonks saying, maybe we should talk about a nonpartisan primary with a runoff. And we were like, we're doing that. We're 
we're doing that in St. Louis City. <laughs> so, um, you know, people I think are going to see that it's a good idea. It might take a while to get it implemented, but, uh, you know, we are, we are excited about the possibility of this reform spreading outside of the city. And as far as how I'm feeling, um, I feel cautiously optimistic. Our poll numbers are really good. We have some really passionate people on board. Um, I will say stay tuned to our social media tomorrow for a very big announcement about yeah. a very big endorsement that's coming tomorrow. I'm not gonna, no spoilers, um, but it will be live tomorrow. So um, definitely tune in for that. And um, yeah, I think we're, I think we're optimistic. We have a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do in the next um, five five weeks and five days, not that I'm counting or anything, uh, but I think we can get it done. Well, then, and, and, and to what Mike said, and even what you said a little bit, Mallory, you know, uh, folks in Missouri might be, you know, slow to pick it up, but you've definitely inspired people throughout the country. I get emails every day <laughs> from many people all over, all over the country, many people even on this call that are inspired by what you're doing that are really pulling for you, are really rooting for you. And uh, my, my final question uh, is for Mallory, uh, what can people do to help? What do you need? What could you use? Yeah, um, thanks so much for asking that question. So we need two things. Um, we need people and like all campaigns at this phase, we need money. Um, I'll just be honest about it. We've got about a $25,000 gap in our fundraising that we're gonna try to make up here in our, in our last five weeks. We're having some really good conversations, but um, you know, in order to really hit our targets on the number of doors we wanna knock, the number of radio ads we wanna run, the number of digital spots we wanna put in place, um, we need to we need to get that money in. Um, so Caitlin is being awesome and putting our fundraising link in the chat right now. So if you like what we're doing and you wanna you wanna make a gift tonight, um, this is this is not in, uh, endorsed by CES. I'm doing this totally on the fly. I hope that it's okay. Um, would would love to get you engaged as a donor. Um, we also have a huge fundraising event next Friday night that's gonna be all virtual, um, really fun. We're gonna have bartenders teach us how to make cocktails at home. We're gonna send you a cocktail kit. Um, we have a band that's gonna do an exclusive performance. They actually wrote a song about us and it's so good. Um, and they're gonna play it for us um, for the call. So. Um, look for information on that. And then if you don't have money, no problem. We can use your manpower. Um, no matter if you are here in St. Louis or anywhere in the country, people outside of St. Louis can send text messages and write postcards to our voters. We need lots of folks to help with that. And if you're here in St. Louis, we would love to have you knocking doors. Like I said, doing those no contact lit drops. Um, and being with us at the polls on election day. So um, Caitlin is dropping all of our links in the chat for us and I will drop my personal contact information as well. So um, reach out if you want to get involved. Awesome, thank you, Mallory. Yes, it's, it's totally fine to ask for money uh, on here because we are all get good campaign people and we would not be doing our job if we didn't do that. Um, and so I will do the same thing. Make sure that if, if, if you've enjoyed today's uh, event, uh, you want to help us support in St. Louis, and you also want to help us support throughout the country, uh, please uh, consider making a donation at electionscience.org. I'm sure Caitlin will, will drop it in, uh, in the chat. I want to thank uh, virtual, give a round of applause for our, uh, for our panel today. Uh, Michael, Rasheen, Mallory, Kathleen, thank you so much um, for everything you're doing and best of luck. You have not just everyone here, but everyone all over the country pulling for you guys. So thank you. So, thank you so much for coming out and have a great night, everybody. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks for hosting. Appreciate thank it. You thank you guys. See you. Bye-bye.